Good afternoon. Welcome to the library. Uh, this is our second uh, lecture for our graphic novel symposium. Thank you for coming. Um, just a couple quick reminders. We have uh, comic shops set up outside selling uh, a range of different books and other things. So uh, we hope you'll go out there and take a look at their stuff. Uh, tomorrow at 11 a.m., Jason King, faculty member, will be talking about gaming and learning. And then in the afternoon from noon to 4, we're going to be playing some games in the coffee bar. So come, a range of games. It's going to be fun. So come, hang out, play games with us. Uh, and with that, what other things? Uh, check out our graphic novel collection in the library. I think Cheryl's going to mention some titles that we have uh, with some excellent books. I want to thank um, Espresso Love, our coffee bar. They've helped support this event. Um, our comic shops, obviously, and our marketing department, which helped do a lot of promotion um, as we got ready for this. Oh, yes, and uh, Brenda, our superhero cutout person who's standing in the middle, it's our part of our marketing. If you take a selfie with her, tweet it to Comic Culture, you can win fabulous, amazing prices, including gift cards to comic shops, some cool Moraine Valley stuff, and uh, yeah, Pat's back there pointing. Uh, so do that, take a picture, put it online. With that, let me introduce Cheryl Bundy, uh, Faculty member, teaches writing, teaches literature, has mm -hmm. been with Moraine for a number of years, almost as long as me, it's, longer? Yeah, yeah, like 16. So uh, yeah. she's excellent and mm -hmm. um, teaches graphic novels. And um, I wanted to have her come uh, talk about the literary side and give us a different flavor about this uh, genre. So thank you. And with that, mm -hmm. here's Cheryl. Thanks. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, if you're sitting at all in the back, there's still plenty of room up here. Uh, I am going to be showing some little bits and pieces from some of the text um, that, that I use. And all of the texts, I'm pretty confident, are here in our library. We have really a great collection of graphic novels, actually. Uh, and that's a very exciting thing, because that probably wouldn't have been the case you know, back when I first started here um, 16 years ago, uh, which is a long time. Um, what I want to start off with is really just a, a, a question. Uh, I'm curious to know what you think of when you hear that word comics. What are some things that come to mind, whether they're characters that you find endearing uh, or certain uh, strips or books? I'm just curious to know when you hear that word comics, what pops into your head? And just shout some stuff out. So, so pictures, tights, <laughs> what else? Superheroes. Garfield? Oh, God, I had a, a, quite a Garfield collection when I was young. Um, what else? Other characters and things like that? Marvel. Marvel. So are there a lot of superhero comic fans here? Show of hands. OK, what about um, the Sunday funny papers, like comic strips? Boondocks. Boondocks. That's a very good strip. Zips. Yeah, 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 good. Other strips that you read? Calvin What's that? Calvin and Hobbes, yes. Foxtrot, that's another good one, very cool. So it's, it's fun to just uh, sort of think about um, the idea of this kind of visual medium. And it really takes a lot of different forms. Uh, what we're gonna eventually talk about today are graphic novels and what that might mean and how it might be different from a comic strip or even a comic book. Um, but I, I kind of want to give you a, a little bit of context of my own history with this form and sort of where I'm coming from. And you mentioned some things already that, um, that are kind of near and dear to me. Uh, things were really different for me when I was a kid um, because there were really only two places I could access comic type things at all. And it was either uh, the Sunday funny papers, right? So the Sunday paper, I would you know, definitely read all of that stuff. Um, and then the only other place I could ever really get comics were the grocery stores I would go to with my gram uh, when I was in Wisconsin in the summer. Uh, other than that, I had no window to get any of those sorts of texts. Um, we didn't have the internet back then, and so it was very different for me. Uh, the kinds of texts that I read were things like this. I was a big Archie fan. In fact, I have uh, quite a pile of Archie comics uh, in my house, and this was something that I just read over and over again. I loved Archie Comics uh, the most, uh, and that was the one that I, I probably would get most often. Um, superhero stories, once in a while, my two brothers would maybe get some, but um, I, and I would read them if there were nothing else to read. And it's funny because these days I'm a huge fan of Marvel. Um, not comics necessarily, but definitely the films. Um, and I'm starting to get more into uh, to reading. So Archie was definitely uh, on my landscape. 
Uh, another kind of comic I would get my hands on would be something like uh, Mad Magazine. I loved Mad Magazine. Uh, and Spy versus Spy, definitely one of my favorite parts of Mad Magazine. Um, and and the, those, again, were two things that I had access to mostly at the grocery store because I didn't know of any comic book stores. I didn't even have any friends who read comics. I just didn't know anybody. And these days, it's so easy to find other fans online. Uh, and back then, it was much, much more difficult to do. Uh, in terms of what I would read in the paper, the things I really obsessed over were comics, comics like these. Um, Gary Larson's The Far Side, and I'll give you a second to take a look at that one. This is a good one. Um, I, I, think what I, I think what I like about Larson, and, and these comics were really around from uh, like 1980 to 1995. Um, one of the ways that Larson uh, used humor is that he would take two very familiar things, in this case the idea of hell and the idea of aerobics class, and then he would smush them together. And it was in that juxtaposition that we found the humor. Uh, and it was something he did over and over again uh, to great effect. The other thing that he would do is something kind of like you see in this cartoon. So he would offer, uh, I guess, a glimpse into something maybe we wouldn't have access to. In this case, the fact that normally the cows are just hanging out together, walking around in the fields, right? And he would use those two techniques so often in his comics. And it was something that was surprising to me at the time. It was intellectually interesting to me at the time. And it was one of the reasons why I, I loved uh, th that strip so much. Uh, another example, and this is one uh, I think one of you mentioned, but probably a lot of you know Calvin and Hobbes at least a little bit. And I'm going to give you a second to take a peek at that one, because I think you can read it based on where you're sitting. Calvin and Hobbes was a favorite of mine. Uh, this is a strip that ran between 1985 and 1995. And so for me, this was like my high school and then college years. And so one of the things that I always found interesting about Calvin and Hobbes was the author, uh, uh, Bill Watterson, his focus on education. Like he often criticized education. He made fun of it to no end. And, and again, as a student at the time, I found all of it incredibly appealing and intellectually interesting. Uh, I loved that so much about these strips. Um, throughout those years, I was definitely a reader of plenty of comics. Um, and amassed quite a collection of any of those strips. Like you could go to the store and buy a Garfield collection. I had plenty of Gary Larson collections. You could eventually buy the entire Calvin and Hobbes collection. So books that collected uh, strips that would appear in the Sunday papers. Um, in the middle of my college years, there was a book that came out, though, um, that seemed radically different from anything I'd seen before. And it was incredibly appealing. And it was suddenly something everyone knew about. It, it was very popular. Uh, and it actually won a Pulitzer Prize. It was so um, significant. And that book is this one. Uh, this is just a little glimpse of uh, that book. It's called Mouse. And it's by Art Spiegelman came out in 1991. And it really was the first graphic novel to get a significant prize, like a Pulitzer. I mean, that was really unheard of back then. And just taking a peek at this, you might see how it would be sort of different from any of the other stuff I've shown you so far. And I'll give you a second to take a look at it. So a couple of things about Mouse. It's a 300-page work in this format, OK? Uh, it's a two-volume set. And it's basically about uh, Art Spiegelman, who is the creator of it. Um, it's about him talking to his dad about his dad's experiences in the Nazi concentration camps. And it's much more than that. Uh, but that is a, a basic sort of summary of what the book is about. Uh, and what you see here in just these two panels is Art Spiegelman talking to his dad. And then you see us go actually into a flashback where uh, some characters are yelling. And we see some text on the top in the second panel. 
um, continuing the story almost like a voiceover narration. And the box in the corner as well continues that sort of voiceover narration. So there's a lot of stuff going on <laughs> just in these two little panels that make it a little bit different from reading a Calvin and Hobbes strip. The other thing that's uh, added in here, uh, which maybe you can notice just by looking at the way the characters are drawn, is that there's some symbolism at play. Uh, we have uh, the Jewish people depicted as mice and the Germans are depicted as cats. And so there's some interesting stuff going on there, some interesting choices on the part of the creator. Um, so looking at that text, being someone who was in college at the time, someone who always was sort of interested in this visual way of, of expressing ideas and expressing little stories, uh, to see something like this was really quite radical. And for a lot of people, just mainstream people who weren't like comic book junkies, um, Definitely, this was something that was surprising. I'll show you a couple of other uh, panels. I'll give you a chance to take a look. I think probably if you were here for Eric's talk, um, he probably would say that a lot of these techniques were nothing new. I mean, it's not like the idea of having this train, this image outside of panels entirely, you know, just being there at the top of the page, like imposing on the rest of the story, right? Like that technique itself probably wasn't something new. But for the mainstream public, this form of sharing a story was something very new. Um, and just a lot of interesting choices here, too, in terms of how the story is being told, the amount of detail in the panels, even the choices about the way the characters are looking at us as they're you know, seeing where they're going. This is just the, the bottom of that last page I was showing you. Again, lots of interesting choices being made. Uh, and, and what I want to tell you about the story, too, is that it wasn't just the, the way the art was represented or the idea of using symbolism, the cat and the mice, and so on. Um, the story itself was incredibly complex. Um, on the surface, there is the story of Art Spiegelman talking to his dad and, and his dad recounting all of the things that happened to him. But woven into that is a present day story about Art Spiegelman and his dad just trying to reconcile their own relationship and Art Spiegelman and his, and his wife and, and all of these other details that are a part of the story too. So just like we might find in a rather complex novel, many different stories being kind of paralleled, woven together and so on. And then you've got the use of flashback going in and out of that uh, in order to tell the story. Again, for, for the mainstream public, this was really quite different. Uh, and, and it was notable, it was important, it got the Pulitzer Prize. Um, the, the question became like, what do we call this thing? And the term that we've been using a lot is uh, a, a graphic novel. And I, and I do wanna try to give you a sense of uh, where that term came from. Uh, because again, this text, Mouse, was not the first graphic novel that we ever saw. There were other ones that came before it, but it's just suddenly it was on a scale where um, the mainstream public had access to it and recognized it as something important. Uh, and that marked kind of a big turning point, really, for all of this. Um, so a little bit about kind of where this term comes from, because there are these other texts that have existed. Um, the, uh, an earlier text, in fact, a text where the, the creator of it, Will Eisner, uh, coined the phrase graphic novel, is A Contract with God. And this is a book that came out in uh, 1978. Okay? And, and what's interesting about it is that it's the first original comic work of art published by a trade publisher. Okay? So the fact that someone else, you know, outside of the realm of comics was going to publish this text uh, was notable in and of itself. Uh, it's a book that's basically a, a collection of stories following a set of working class Jewish people who are living in New York City during the Great Depression. And even just looking at this, like this is an entire page in the novel. 
it looks very different <laughs> from some of the strips that we started with, even from traditional sorts of superhero comics, right? Um, there aren't any panels here. Um, the drawings are very realistic. Uh, one of the things that we see too in this text is that um, in terms of the subject matter, like Eisner was, was perfectly willing to show quite horrific scenes, moments where characters are being cruel to one another, um, real true stories that uh, resonated with readers. Um, it wasn't a book meant for kids to consume in any way. Um, and for Will Eisner, who actually was someone who worked in superhero comics prior to creating this text, um, I think he realized that kids who grew up on comics in earlier decades had matured and were grown up. And so there might be a market for stories told this way for older adults. Okay. And one of the things I want to share about this text too is, um, is a quote from uh, Stephen Weiner who wrote a history of uh, the graphic novel. And this is about Eisner's text. He said, not only was the subject matter new to comic book readers, the presentation was fresh as well. Rather than crowding the pages with panels detailing character movements, the drawings were large, focusing on facial expression. And the panels opened outward almost beyond the page. So there was a sense that, that as people looked at these, this book, that it had a, a different feel compared to other sorts of text. And this is just another page from that text, an interesting perspective shot. And thinking about it as literature, like thinking about what we could notice in these uh, sorts of texts, I mean, there are ways we can talk about the setting and how the setting is depicted, the details that are presented to us, and what, might th what that might tell us about the lives of these people and, and what those lives are like. Uh, but again, it's, it's interesting to see these old texts. And, uh, and, and this one definitely was um, probably one of the first graphic novels as we sort of conceive of them today. Uh, another one that came out not really far after that that maybe you are familiar with already is uh, Watchmen, Alan Moore's. Uh, and and uh, sort of in a similar time frame uh, would be uh, Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns. Okay, so two other longer works uh, grounded in the superhero um, mythos, right? But notable in the way that they treated it, different in the way that they treated it. Um, and these books, again, coupled with the last one I showed you, start to open the door for a mainstream public to accept the idea of a full-length graphic novel. Um, what's interesting about these texts is the serious way that they treated uh, the superhero concept and story. At least in Watchmen, uh, the characters are unmasked. The texts end up raising questions about the superheroes' motivations and their morality, and the role that power plays to sort of impact those motivations. Uh, and just to share another uh, quote related to that, both Watchmen and Dark Knight had at least one message in common. Don't get caught in a dark alley with someone choosing to wear a mask and fight crime. He wouldn't necessarily turn out to be a nice guy or anyone that you could depend on. In fact, his sanity was probably held together with masking tape. And so it's this sort of questioning of who are these people behind the mask. It's something that we've seen certainly in the more recent um, superhero type movies, right? Um, where uh, the whole idea of, of of who is behind the mask and what is their life all about uh, starts to be questioned a little bit more. It's very interesting. Um, so we kind of go back to this question of, uh, of what is a graphic novel? And one way to, to sort of think about it is as a format and not like a genre of text, okay? Um, because within that format, a graphic novel could be a work of fiction, okay, which is a genre a graphic novel could be a work of nonfiction, okay? It could be a romance, it could be sci-fi, it could be fantasy, horror, superhero, like any of these genres that we're familiar with, okay? And it's more about the format that we're experiencing the story in, okay? A couple of other things we can probably say about it. Um, certainly we see that 
they are longer works presenting a story in depth. Any of these that I've shown you so far are, are longer works. They're not like a smaller comic book that you'd pick up. They're obviously not like the comic strips that we've seen either. Um, and many of the elements of the story are presented visually. I have a hard time um, figuring out a good way to define a graphic novel because I don't want to try to argue that a graphic novel is more complex than a comic book or a comic strip. I don't want to argue that it's more sophisticated. I don't want to argue that it's more anything um, than comic books or comic strips. I don't know that those distinctions are incredibly helpful. Uh, I know that we can look at a text like Mouse and recognize that it's longer, that there's this big complex story that it's working with. Um, but we could kind of analyze any text. And so I don't know that I want to put it up on a, like a special pedestal and say somehow that graphic novels are, are different from other sorts of comic texts. Just to give you an example of how we can apply analysis to anything, even if it's just popular, I have uh, Archie again. And one sort of interesting thing about, uh, about the particular artist who, uh, who draws uh, some of the Archie comics is uh, what we would call today a, a photo bomb. Like there's this character like in the panel just taking up a big chunk of the panel looking at us while all the action's going on in the back. It's kind of weird. Um, and then when you start to see that actually it happens a lot, and I'll give you a chance to read if you want to read. Like, I think that's really interesting. And I know that we're just looking at a comic book and it's Archie, and somehow that means it's lesser, but there's some interesting choices being made. And what does it mean that the panel is drawn in that way with this character crowding the space? Is it a way for, um, I guess, world building to happen? In other words, it seems like the world is bigger than just them in any of these scenes. Like, is that the meaning of it? Um, is there a judging eye, you know, being cast on what's going on with any of the characters? Because, you know, if you know anything about Archie and, and the world of Riverdale, like, there's a lot of goofy things going on uh, that aren't necessarily, like, the most important things in the world, right? Fighting over boyfriends and girlfriends and whatnot. Um, so is this a, like a gaze that's meant to judge in some way? I, I don't know. But noticing patterns in these kinds of texts, especially in visual texts, is really what studying literature is all about. So I don't know if I want to say that Archie is literature, but I don't want, know if I want to say that it isn't, because any of these texts can be analyzed if we're looking for the patterns, if we're looking for things, and if we have kind of an open eye and an open mind. Uh, and I think that's exciting. I think that's one of the things I enjoy me most about analyzing text, especially visual ones. Just to give you an example now going back into the world of uh, the graphic novel, this is Jean Luen Yang's uh, American Born Chinese. Okay. It's a, another uh, complex tale. There are three stories that are being told in the text. And it's almost like the movie Crash, where there's a way that they all connect at the end. There's, and it's a really phenomenal way that they connect at the end. Uh, well, one of the stories chronicles this little character that you see up here. Uh, his name is Jin Wang. And he's the only uh, Chinese American kid at his school. And so in his story, this new kid uh, from Taiwan shows up. And, and Jin just wants nothing to do with him. What he really wants is to be like this other guy, Danny, who is the all-American boy. He's the football player. And as we watch Danny's story unfold, um, we learn that when Danny's Chinese cousin, Chin Ki, shows up to visit, disaster ensues. The stories are ultimately about stereotypes. They're about racism. And you can see some examples of that in this teacher and how she responds to um, to Jen. But what we can do with it in terms of thinking about it as literature 
and thinking about the art of this text is when we look at um, the actual page of the book, the panels actually look just like this. There's a ton of white space on every page, which is very interesting. And I wonder sometimes if, um, if the presentation of the pages in this particular book has to do with showing us how uh, people can be boxed in, because every page, like everything is a square, basically. So I don't know if that's the purpose of it, that it shows a kind of confinement because of the stereotypes and our attitudes and so on. So just like we can notice a pattern in the Archie comics, we can notice patterns in our graphic novels too. I'll give you another example of the kind of analysis or way we can try to think about the visual effect of the pages. This is a page from um, I, Mary's uh, A plus E forever, which is a, a really beautiful story. It follows the lives of these two characters who are exploring their own identities. They're high school students. They're uh, exploring their own um, sexualities. And what's interesting about it is that uh, the outward appearance of both of the characters, Asher and you, um, causes them to be uh, labeled very quickly by other people. And so part of the book is questioning those labels, questioning, um, the, I guess, the fluidity of gender and sexuality. And the art of the book is kind of like that too. Like when you compare this to um, American Born Chinese and what I just showed you and how nice and neat everything was, how boxed in everything was, this looks very messy. <laughs> it looks very different. Uh, in fact, we barely have panels. And in the top right hand corner, you can just glimpse some of the text up there. That's dialogue between characters. And as you read it, one of the challenges is knowing that you're actually switching voices and things like that. Um, it's, it's very messy in that way. And in some ways, the dialogue flows fluidly from one person to the other, uh, which mirrors a little bit what some of the book is about. So there are these interesting choices being made about how to present the characters and how to present their interactions uh, that definitely connect with, uh, with the idea of the books. So it's one of the, again, very interesting elements <laughs> to look at in graphic novels. It's hard to uh, not talk about this person's work, Chris Ware, uh, today. He's a very uh, prominent uh, graphic novelist. And what we've been seeing so far is that we can analyze the style of the presentation, that it's a way for us to interact with the rest of the story. And Chris Ware's work almost asks for uh, an entirely different kind of level of participation on our part. Uh, and I'm gonna be passing out in a little while uh, just a couple of pages from one of his books just so you can experience what it's like to try to read them uh, because they're incredibly uh, complex and interesting and so much is communicated in these very small increments of time. So what I'm gonna show you on this screen and then in the next slide it comprises one page of the book and I'm gonna walk you through it just because the writing is so tiny uh, and I know you won't be able to see it. So this is from a book called Building Stories, which isn't really a book as much as a box of a bunch of books. Uh, it's beautiful and it's amazing. And uh, so it's basically this box. And when you open it, there are, I think, maybe 16 different books inside, all different shapes. Some of them fold out like accordions. One of them is kind of like a board game, like very just uh, varied in their presentation, very fascinating. Um, but the, the central character is this, uh, this woman who is uh, sort of a failed artist. Uh, and part of the stories deal with her um, kind of struggling with relationships that she has. So in this little moment, uh, there's a woman in bed and we, we see text telling us that there are some noises. It says, uh, click, step, step, step. And then uh, here's this man, step, 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 shut, the door shuts. And what she's thinking as she's laying there in bed is when do I start, when did we start leaving without kissing, without kissing him or without him kissing me goodbye? And then po out pops this little bubble of uh, a memory of her being kissed uh, by this man. 
And in the next frame, we see her remembering other things. And we see just these little bubbles start kind of floating to the ceiling. She says, when did he start telling me I was getting fat? And then that one starts floating up. When did he start walking by me without touching my head? It floats up and it changes as it floats up. When did he start grabbing me in anger? When did, we start, when did he start looking at me with disgust? And eventually she's sitting there with all of these bubbles just sort of floating over her head. And she thinks, when is it going to stop? And it's this really um, interesting rendering of that moment drawn out over several panels, um, which kind of slows down our own reading, the pacing of the text and our interaction with it, um, so that we can stay with her in this moment of pain. And there's something really interesting about even the color choices, because of course she's in her room in the dark and all of these little thought bubbles are so brightly colored because they just seem so prominent in her mind. It's very interesting. So we've been talking a lot about comics and a little bit about how these texts are different from each other, comics versus graphic novels. We've looked a little bit at the history of the form. And what I wanna do right now is actually give you a chance to try reading some, just so you could see the experience across a variety of texts. And so the first one I'm bringing you is uh, the very first page of A plus E forever. And you saw a little panel of it already, but this is like page one. one two, three. And I just want you to think about what it's like to read it like, where do you start? What are you looking at first? What are you doing with that? And so on. In creative writing, we talk a lot about, well, where do we begin the story? Like, what, where's the best moment to kind of bring our reader into our world? And how can we use these moments to convey something about character, about setting, and so on? And so looking at just this very first page of a &E Forever, it's so fascinating to me anyway to think about this creator's um, way of dumping us into this world. How do you read this? Like what are some things that you did? Is anyone willing to share just what it was like to process this information? And this is all you have so far. There's a lot more to the book obviously, but this is just our page one. Are there some things that you notice here or, or where, where did your eyes, I guess, gravitate first? Mm -hmm. It said like his year, mm -hmm. um, basically, you know, it says like sex still waiting or something like that. <laughs> and he basically even describes like his clothes, I guess, to kind of like to say like, oh yeah, he's just wearing these clothes. I guess, mm -hmm. I guess that's how he, people identify him. Right. And basically I just started reading the stuff on the wall. It's basically the stuff that you would probably still remember finding on the bathroom wall. like. Mm -hmm numbers, like mm -hmm. people responding to what other people wrote there. Right. And it's mostly very negative, which mm -hmm. you can expect from a high school bathroom. No one really writes anything positive on there. Mm -hmm. It's like your, does anyone else want to add some places their mind went first, things that you noticed? Yeah. Well, first my eyes went to the right top corner, and I think it says I'm a loser in Spanish. Mm -hmm. I know for me, I immediately think Beck, right? There's the Beck song from a while back. Um, so that, that's where I go with it too. Um, but yeah, it's, it's fascinating because we're in this place that maybe should be a safe place, a bathroom. And, but there on the wall are all these things that are assaulting the person because it is very negative. There's homophobic stuff on the wall, really aggressive stuff written on the wall. Um, and so you're trying to get a sense of who is this person and how are they responding to that? Because what's interesting about the choice here too is we don't get to see um, Asher's face. We just see him from behind, right? So we don't get to see how he's responding to all of the things that he's encountering. Like we're just a voyeur in a way, um, standing behind him looking at all of this stuff. Um, so very interesting techniques. And these are some things that we might talk about 
obviously, if we're going to analyze and, and sort of try to understand who this character is. Uh, but just to see that as an introduction to him, uh, it's super interesting. Uh, the next uh, sample I have is from Mouse, which you've seen a couple panels of. And this is not the very beginning of the book. I think it's a, the beginning of a chapter. And same thing as before, I just want you to think about what is it like to try to read this? And maybe in the back of your mind, you'll be thinking about how reading this is slightly different than reading the one I just shared with you, right? This one's going to seem a little bit different. My guess would be that interacting with this one feels a little bit different than A&E Forever and that first page. Does anyone want to say something about what was different about it or whether it seemed easier or harder to read or anything at all? Yeah? It seems like there's like a little bit more satire to it, mm -hmm. a little bit more comedy, making fun of like the prescription drugs, which uh, father has to take saying, this is what I call the stuff that pharmacists get me, junk foods. Because there's a lot of times like the doctor's always describe mm -hmm. me a certain amount of pills, taking mm -hmm. this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, when he, uh, Ask, well, Dad, did, did Mom have any boyfriends before you? Say, is this one tall guy from Warsaw? He was a communist. It is, it is funny. Um, and, and I think that there are, are uh, plenty of ways that um, the, the choices about what these characters say helps create their characters and maybe their wry senses of humor and things like that. So that's, I think, definitely present. We certainly get at least some speech here, and we didn't in the first page from A&E Forever. Um, what else? Other comments you want to make about what it was like to, to process this a little bit and read it, or just follow along with it, for that matter? Was it easy to get into the flashback? Because we do jump into one sort of towards the end, right? So it's a rather smooth transition there. Um, so again, what you'll notice as you interact with graphic novels is that there are so many different techniques that the writers will use um, to move us in and out of different elements. You know, here again, we have sort of what, what I would call like voiceover narration in a way, because it's like if you're watching a film and you hear someone talking over the scene, uh, that's what happens on the second page once we shift into the flashback. Um, we still hear Art Spiegelman's father talking uh, about what's going on in that scene. So just a, a, a difference in how the stuff is presented. What I really want to do is show you this Chris Ware set of pages, because this one's going to be very different. And the front page, let's see, let me pass this out to you. I'm trying to pass it out so that it's clear which is the first page. This is from the very beginning of a book called Jimmy Corrigan, The Smartest uh, Boy on Earth. Does anyone need more time with this one? It takes a lot longer, right? Um, what was different about this one? This one's really different. What's different about it, about your ability to process it? What did you have to do compared to Mouse or compared to a and &E Forever? Mm -hmm. As in the other two, you get the visual and the emotions are really present in the words, but in this mm -hmm. one, you really have to put in the emotions. Yeah, I feel like there are there are these gaps, and you're you're looking at what's going on, and then you're trying to think, okay, so how is he feeling at this moment, and what's even really going on here? Because that isn't totally clear unless you're really kind of digging through these frames. Um, even just figuring out where to read next, I find, is a challenge here. I don't know if that's true for you all as well. Like figuring out where, in some places he puts little arrows to just point you to the next little box, which I think is really cool. Um, and, and again, it's like we are kind of moving generally left to right, but I think it's more complicated than that. Um, and there's a lot going on in the story, right? Because like, what's going on in the story? What, what is this li two little page thing a story about? What's going on? What's that? Appearance and reality. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we have little, this is little Jimmy, of course, who, just in terms of the details that are presented here uh, in the very first frames, like he's so into superheroes, e even the showing him with his hand out the window going like this, you know, like he's flying, and, and nothing is said. We don't hear Jimmy say anything about what was important to him. It's just presented to us visually. Uh, and so we take that as part of the character development at that moment. 
Uh, and then we see them get to this location and he just bolts for that Superman booth because he wants that autograph. And then of course we find out what the Superman character is really like. Um, and the hard part is I think watching him uh, get dragged along <laughs> like on the date with his mom. Uh, so very interesting. And of course Superman comes home with them <laughs> at the end. So we see that. Uh, dialogue is, I think, very interesting in terms of how it's presented. Uh, you really do have to think a little bit about who's probably saying it, right? Whereas in Mouse, it was really clear who was speaking because we have a very kind of obvious um, speech bubble, right? And that isn't really how uh, Chris Weir is presenting that material. Yeah? Just so sad. Just it is. <laughs> just deflates. He sees him, he's so excited, and then all yeah. of a sudden his face just empties. And then disappears, you know, his, his whole, he's just holding the autograph in the back of the seat, mm -hmm. he's ignored and it's over and he wanted to be part of the superhero, he wanted to be a superhero and now he doesn't. I mean. there's, a, there's a great little contrast, I'm on the second page and in the middle uh, panel at the very top, Jimmy's sitting there and here's another neat little setting detail, like nobody's there to see Superman, there's some dude in the back with a hat on looking at a book, right? Um, and Jimmy's sitting there going, ha, 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 he's laughing, he's totally enjoying the moment. And then you contrast that with uh, a panel that's on the very last row. He's sitting in the back seat looking at his autograph, and there's a ha, ha that's lingering there in the air. But now it's just the flirting between the Superman character and the mother. And so there's, there's a very interesting like, parallel there that's, that's incredibly sad. Uh, just in that moment as you try to kind of dismantle the scene and really analyze it and see what's going on. Yeah, what else? Uh, I noticed, you know, he's supposed to be a young kid, but the way his face is, mm -hmm. he's really old. Yeah, that, that's, that's a, a, a trait uh, of this text and how this character is presented. Um, Chris Ware is a, a Chicago artist, I think, and I know that, that this story and building stories takes place in Chicago. Um, and this story is definitely focused more on Jimmy as an adult. And so I don't know if the, the way that he's drawn in, as a kid is meant to uh, help us connect with the older version of him, if it's meant to show that he's different from other kids maybe, you know, he doesn't look like the other kids. Um, but yeah, I noticed that about it too. It's definitely how I respond to the character and the way that he's drawn. Um, other comments? So I kind of presented you with uh, three different stories uh, just so you could experience what it's like to try to read them. I find that when I use these texts in my class, when I bring in a graphic novel, it's funny because it's, um, it's not unlike when I bring in uh, like a foreign film. My students will say, oh, it's so hard to read. And they get frustrated with it because the meaning doesn't unfold the way we're, we're maybe used to in uh, reading a typical sort of print novel, okay? Um, and just in looking at these two pages, there was a lot we had to do to sort of understand what's going on and then get to the level where we can look at the symbolism of it or parallels and things like that. Um, so it's, it's a different kind of experience. I think a, a really good experience, but different. Uh, what I want to sort of end with, and then I'll take your questions, is just a quick um, presentation of some of the other texts that we have here. Uh, and I will say that, that a good number of them uh, fall into this category of a nonfiction autobiography. It's just for whatever reason, maybe it's because of Mouse and the success of Mouse, uh, but there, ha there is definitely a trend for graphic novels that are autobiographical, like stories of uh, forming identity um, in, the, in that whole format. And here is one example of, of uh, one of those texts. This is probably one of my favorite uh, graphic novels. It's called Persepolis. It's by Marjane Sartrapi. And uh, there was a movie version of this, uh, actually, uh, that was nominated for an Oscar. Uh, this is a book that came out uh, in 2000. 
And it's basically about the author's experience uh, growing up in Iran during the Islamic Revolution. As you can see just by looking at the art, the art is incredibly beautiful. And um, there's something about the very strong lines of the art that I find really appealing. Uh, and then there's a lot of um, imagery throughout the book like this, where it's almost like an M.C. Escher kind of print. There's something about the, the patterns and the way that she will uh, create, even in that uh, top row, um, these sort of parallel images. Uh, that's incredibly beautiful. Uh, but it's a wonderful story, too. And uh, we have this text. Another uh, pretty well-known uh, graphic novel in a similar vein, another autobiographical nonfiction, is um, Alison Bechdel's Fun Home. And this is about the author's life after her father dies. And it's also a, a sort of uh, coming out story. It's about her experiences coming out. Uh, and it's, again, beautifully rendered, uh, super interesting and, and quirky and uh, fascinating. Another of my favorites is Ghost World. Maybe you've seen the movie version of it. Uh, the movie version is great, but I love the art <laughs> of Daniel Close uh, in, this, in this text. And so uh, this is another, uh, this is a work of fiction. And it's another high school-based story. Like, I, I think it could be interesting to, to maybe pair this with a &E Forever as a kind of high school uh, story of, of people trying to figure out who they are, figuring out what to do post high school, and so on. Um, it's, it's dark, and it's crass, and it's incredibly funny. And it's also about how uh, to manage your relationships as you start kind of moving on and away from whatever that high school crew was. So it's one of the things that I like most about that text. Um, this is a work of nonfiction. There actually are uh, some interesting works of nonfiction that are almost um, graphic novel journalism. And this one is called Pyongyang, A Journey into North Korea. And it's about uh, a, 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 um, a, a guy who is a animator. Okay, so he does animation work for film, and he got the chance to uh, go to North Korea uh, in order to do some of that work. And while he was there, he, uh, he wrote and he drew and he captured his experience. And uh, it's incredibly fascinating, um, and it's a, a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, another nonfiction, this is probably uh, one of my other favorite uh, texts, and I think we have this one now. I know that, uh, that we're working on getting it. Uh, after 9-11, uh, there was this giant um, book that was published. It was the commission report. And it was maybe about this thick, and I bought it, and I never read it. Um, but then a comic book version came out, and I read that. And it's a brilliant uh, book. It's basically uh, an example of a graphic novel that is adapting a text that already exists. Because, I mean, if you go into uh, the graphic novel section of the bookstore, or the library, you'll find that one other little uh, subset of these texts are adaptations. Like I have a really cool copy of Kafka's The Metamorphosis in graphic novel form. Uh, there's a three volume set uh, called The Graphic Canon, where they've had various artists put together uh, comic book versions, graphic novel versions of things like uh, Jane Eyre and so on, you know, famous uh, literary texts. Uh, so they're adapting something that already exists just in a new form, and that's what this one is. But it's probably one of the best books I've ever read about 9-11, uh, hands down. Uh, and one last book uh, that I wanted to mention is, has a very weird title. It's called Asterios Polyp, and it's by uh, David Mezzicelli. And it's a very interesting book. It's a fiction story about a professor whose apartment gets struck by lightning and it burns down and he decides to just get away from his life as far as he can and he ends up becoming a mechanic somewhere and in the end he has to face everything that's happened to him in his life and deal with his past but what's interesting about it is the way the art is done um, the creator assigns different artistic styles and colors to different characters. So there'll be moments where characters will be interacting, and one character is usually all yellow and you know very um, blocky, and the other character is usually pink. And so when those characters are interacting together, all of those colors are blending. So there's something really unique about the art and the way it's presented in the text that I, I find appealing. Um, the last thing I wanted to share with you, and then I'll take any questions you have, is just a, a, an actual print text 
that is notable right now because it's a part of Chicago's One Book, uh, One Chicago program. And that book is uh, Michael Shabin's uh, The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay. It's another Pulitzer Prize winning book, but it's about like the glory days of comic books, superhero comic books. Um, and it's a work of fiction, but it's almost like historical fiction the way it reads. It's amazing, it's brilliant, uh, it's a fun story. And so if you're interested in the idea of what those artists' lives were like back then, uh, this is really a great read. And it's a good time to do it because you could go see the author. Uh, he's gonna be here this fall. Not here, but he's gonna be downtown uh, as a part of the program. So it would be a cool opportunity. So I, I wanted to share that as well. Um, are there any questions about anything? Was this interesting at all? Was it helpful? Questions, things you're curious about? You good? Cool, we'll stick around if you have any questions. I'm happy to share anything I know about these texts. And again, most of the ones that I've shared with you today are definitely located here in our library. So thank you. Thank you.